Hello. Hi. Oh, so nice to see you all. We are going to get started. Feel free to make yourselves comfortable as we get underway here. I want to say thank you for joining us this evening in person with us here in the Norden Auditorium at Olin or via the live stream. My name is Callan Bagnoli, and I am the director of the library at Olin. I'm also a critical technology scholar. And I had the chance to meet Frances Haugen through the Movement Building Co-Curricular, led by her and Professor Erhard Graef. We were joined by a small team of Olin students who helped Frances think through plans and ideas for her goals of creating a tech ethics and reform movement at college campuses around the nation. You are seeing some of the outcomes of this group tonight. As an educator who supports aspiring engineers and teaches them to think about ethics and the social impacts of technology, I was so proud to be able to work with Frances. Um, and when I heard that she was an alum of, of Olin, I was immeasurably proud. I will say that we are of a similar age, so I did not have the pleasure of teaching her. <laughs> Frances gave the students in this movement building group a special opportunity to work with and learn from her. And I know that was so inspiring and important for all of them. We are lucky to have alumni like Francis, who serve as role models and mentors to our students. And it has been amazing to see Francis engaging with our community in a very special way, both in this co-curricular and with us here on campus today. With that, I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Professor Deb Chatra. Take it away, Deb. Thanks, Colin. Um, and thank you for everyone for being here, whether real, in person, or in virtually. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today. So unlike Callan, I did, in fact, have the pleasure of teaching Frances, um, who was a member of Olin's very first graduating class. So that meant that I met her that when she was a sophomore, and I was in my first year, in fact, in my first weeks, um, of being a professor here. And you know, this is now when I feel like Elrond, right? Like, like, I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3,000 years ago. So, so of course I remember Frances from when we met, and, and I remember sort of that her you know, relentless drive and her relentless enthusiasm were pretty much inextricable from each other. Um, so that semester I was teaching an introductory course on material science, and Frances and her partner were doing a report on wood, and she actually just reminded me that they went to a local lumber yard, um, two teenage girls, and asked for some samples of wood that they could use for that project. Um, so I remember that she would buttonhole me in the cafeteria and like tell me excitedly about what they were doing um, as we were learning about the properties of wood. Um, and then at the end of the project, they handed in their final report. I was expecting everyone's final report to be eight or 10 pages long, and uh, theirs was a little bit longer. It was probably dozens of pages of carefully communicated findings. Um, and I have to say that when I first heard um, that Francis and her team had submitted eight separate distinct SEC whistleblower complaints that were backed by thousands of pages of documents, I was unsurprised. <laughs> um, and actually, you know, Frances just reminded me that she asked me, she knew that there was a minimum for the report, and they asked me, is there a maximum? And I said, um, no, but after 10 pages, I have to want to read it, which I've forgotten about. And so, you know, compelling documentation matters. Um, but, um, you, know, and I, you know, I know that my colleagues here who, who were here then also have their own stories about Frances as a student. Um, she did a senior research project with Rob Martello that was directly in the space of the social context of technology. Um, but what I really want to highlight here is that especially in a place like Olin, we ask our students to bring all of whom they are to their work. And that means maybe in like even especially to the, you know, the most technical engineering work that they do. And part of the reason why we ask that is because we know that everything we do and how we do it shapes who we are and then how we interact with the world. So I know I speak for her former professors and many of us here in the Olin community when I say that we couldn't be prouder to see um, where Francis has taken that approach. Um, I'm now going to thank you um, and I'm going to turn things over to President Gilda Berbino who will then introduce Francis. So thank you so much, Callan and Deb. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today in person here at Olin in our Nordrum Auditorium and those who are joining us via live stream. I am so pleased to welcome Frances Hagen. 
Olin class of 2006 back to our campus to speak with us today. Francis holds a degree in electrical and computer engineering from Olin College and an MBA from Harvard University. She is a specialist in algorithmic product management, having worked on ranking algorithms at Google, Pinterest, Yelp, and Facebook. In 2019, she was recruited to Facebook to be the lead product manager on the civic misinformation team, which dealt with issues related to democracy and misinformation, and later also worked on counter espionage. During her time at Facebook, Frances became increasingly alarmed by the choices the company makes that prioritize their own profits over public safety and puts people's lives at risk. As the last resort and at great personal risk, Frances made the courageous decision to blow the whistle on Facebook. The initial reporting was done by Wall Street Journal in what became known as the Facebook files. Since going public, Frances has testified in front of the United States Congress, the UK, and the European Union parliaments, the French Senate and National Assembly, and has engaged with lawmakers internationally on how to best address the negative externalities of social media platforms. Back in the fall, when news about Frances was made public, the Olin campus was buzzing with the news and the excitement and pride that Frances is one of our very own. At the root of everyone's reaction was that we were not surprised that the person who came forward to blow the whistle was an Oliner. We see in Frances the qualities we see in ourselves, a deep commitment to helping others and fighting for equity and making the world a better place through engineering. So without further delay, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Frances Hagen, Olin class of 2006. Welcome, Frances. Hi, can you guys hear? Oh, good. We hadn't actually sound tested the lab, so I'm, I'm glad it's actually working. Um, hello, thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I have not been back at Olin, I think in, I don't know, oh, do I have feedback? Oh, too far, good, good. now we're good. Um, I don't think I've been back at Olin in maybe at least 10 years, might be longer. Um, I've been trying to decide like which direction to go on this because I, I, I have the things that I usually like to make sure people know, but there's like so much advice I want to give you guys because like you are Oliners. Um, so I think I'll start with my usual stuff and then we'll go to the, the Olin specific advice. Um, so most people are not aware that for at least a billion people in the world, they don't get to choose to leave Facebook, right? So a long time ago, like maybe 10 years ago, and Facebook, you know, looked back on its origins. You know, it killed MySpace, it killed Friendster. I'm old enough that I remember Friendster. The first crawler I ever wrote was a Friendster back in the day. I've always loved graphs. Um, and uh, they looked back on their history and you could tell that out of a, a sense of fear, they made a decision that I think is, is going to be world changing. Like when we look back in history, we say this was a, a world, a history changing decision. Um, and the decision they made was they didn't want to risk that network effects would take root someplace where they were not playing and that a new form of personal social media, so like TikTok is broadcast social media, personal social media was going to emerge somewhere in the world and it was going to come and eat their lunch. And so they outlaid huge sums of money, like billions of dollars, to go pay people in some of the most fragile places in the world um, to use Facebook. They said, if you use Facebook, your data is free. If you use anything on the open web, well, you're gonna have to pay for that yourself. And through the wonder of market incentives, uh, now Facebook is the internet for at least a billion, maybe two billion people. For a majority of languages in the world, 80 or 90% of all the content available on the internet is only available on Facebook. So for a billion, two billion people, to choose to not use Facebook is to choose to not use the internet. 
And even then, they're not really able to opt out because all their neighbors, all their family members, their internet is Facebook. So why does that matter? Like, why does it matter that we here in the United States, where there is the ability to regulate Facebook, where we have direct leverage through things like direct action, why is it so important for us to have this conversation? Facebook in 2018 had a problem. For years, the amount of content being produced on the platform had been declining, and they had tried lots and lots of things to try to get people to produce more content. The only thing they had found that was successful at sustainably getting people to produce more content was giving them more little hits of dopamine. You know, if you get more comments, more likes, more reshares, you, you produce more content. The only problem with this, though, was that the fastest path to a click, be it a like, a comment, a reshare, is anger. Um, is there an echo? Like, I'm getting like a, okay, go. Okay, can I, maybe a, a handheld? Powers of the Beast. Do we have another handout? Or? Sure. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Welcome to the Wonder. Yeah, give it a second. Hello? Ooh, oh, oh, so much better. Okay. Okay, do I, 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 hopefully I don't start at the beginning. Can, can the people in the back hear me at all? Okay, good, good, we won't start at the beginning. Um, so they're like, oh, I'm gonna have to tell my jokes again. But um, no, um, the, um, so for, in 2018, they did this thing where they were like, hmm, if we can get people more likes, comments, reshares, and we can get them more engagement, they'll make more content. And so most of us forget that Facebook is not actually just about consumption. It's a, it's, it's a two-sided marketplace. They, it's about producers who make content and consumers who consume content. It happens to be we call those people our friends or like we think you know, Facebook is about our friends. Um, and, but you need both. And so if people aren't producing, people can't consume. If, uh, what they found though, maybe six months later, was they were sending researchers into all these different European countries right before the European parliamentary elections, and they heard over and over and over again, on the left, on the right, hey, we know you changed the algorithm. And, and the researchers would be like, ooh, tell me more. Like, why do you think we changed the algorithm? And, and because like when, when people tell you how technology works, like you're gonna find this more and more as you go into the world, it actually tells you a huge amount about them, not just about your technology or how you're perceived. You know, people betray things about their fears, what they believe the dangers are, power structures, things about their cultures. It's like mythology. And so like, the researchers like, oh, tell us more. Like, why do you think we changed? And they'd be like, no, 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 no. We, we know you changed. Like, it used to be that we could share the bread and butter of democracy, like, like a white paper on our agricultural policy. And it's not like I got the most comments, but we can look at the statistics. We could see that people were reading it. Like, it got consumed. But now, if we produce the exact same content, it's just crickets. It doesn't go anywhere. We are literally running different positions and framing things in different ways. Ways that, you know, we know from focus groups, our constituents don't even like that much because it's the only thing that gets distributed on Facebook. By the time we show up in the ballot box, Facebook already voted. Facebook voted first, because we only get to vote on things if they're ideas that can spread on the algorithm. Um, so when we combine these two things, right, that, that Facebook has made product choices, things like pushing people into groups um, that they never asked to join, you know, so they got invited to a, uh, to a group, maybe by someone who was spamming people with invites, and because they engaged with a post that was put in their feed for 30 days, now Facebook considered them as part of that group. You know, Facebook made it this series of product choices and, al and, and, and algorithmic choices, or chose not to fix them. And all these things put together mean the most extreme ideas get the most reach, the most distribution. When you combine that with a billion people, maybe two billion people not getting to consent on whether or not to participate on Facebook, it becomes really, really dangerous. 
I had an editorial in the New York Times today that was about the idea that we need to be talking about linguistic equity. Linguistic equity is the idea that my life and the safety of my life shouldn't be dependent on the language I speak. Facebook knows that the place they're in the most danger, and by danger I mean someone might tell them they can't just do whatever they want, is the United States. And the way we can tell this is of Facebook's operational budget for misinformation in 2022, 87% was spent on English, 87%. Only 9% was spent on English for something called brand safety, which is, should we show ads next to offensive content? Right, 9%. And that's because about 9% of users speak English. Right, that's the problem. Um, Facebook is afraid that we will ask them to do better. And they know that they can understand or, or not support languages in the most fragile places in the world. And the, the most fragile places in the world are often linguistically diverse, and they often speak smaller languages. They know they can get away with that because it doesn't matter if someone protests in the streets of Addis Ababa. Um, it doesn't matter if there's ethnic violence in Ethiopia. It doesn't matter if it's in Myanmar because they're thousands of miles away. They can't do anything. And so we here in the United States have an extra responsibility because we live in an interconnected world. You know, we can't leave a billion people behind, right? I, I, think, it, I think literally 10 or 20 million lives are on the line in the next 20 years. Like these are not the end of the tragedies. This is the first two tragedies. So the question is, what do we do next? Um, I'm in the middle of founding a nonprofit. Um, and we are going to be working a bunch on um, ESG standards. So that's how do you, um, how do you define if an investment is actually pro-social? Pro um, because we're gonna, there's a huge amount of investors that want to divest, but they don't have the criteria to describe why is Twitter different than Facebook. We're going to work with class action litigators on like what is duty of care. So that's things like saying, how hard should you have to work to keep under 13-year-olds off the platform? Um, and we're gonna work on campus organizing because one of the things that will drive things like divestment is the actions of, of students. The way we can help define duty of care is to work on articulating these things together. And the last one is we really wanna work with college students to figure out how can high schoolers and how can junior high students or even elementary school students, how can they care for each other? Because the thing that you see over and over again in Facebook's own documents is that Facebook knows that Instagram is, is seriously harmful to the mental health of teenagers. And as I was corrected, I, I went to the largest mommy blogger conference in the world a couple days ago. It's called Mom 2.0. They're very effective. Like they have hundreds of thousands of followers each. Um, and they pointed out to me that I, I am not talking about this correctly because there are eight and nine-year-olds on Instagram now. I was like, oh, hmm, I clearly don't have a nine-year-old. Um, but uh, and so we need to talk about Facebook knows that Instagram isn't just bad for kids' mental health. So, you know, 13% of teenage girls said that it made their thoughts of suicide worse. You know, 30%, 33% of teenage girls said it made their, their body image issues worse. It's not, it's not just that it's bad for them. It's that it's significantly worse than other forms of social media. The TikTok is about performance, about humor, about doing things with your friends. Um, Snapchat is about faces and augmented reality. Reddit is at least vaguely about ideas. But like Snapchat, not Snapchat, Instagram is about bodies and social comparison, right? And it doesn't have to be, right? There's lots and lots of things that Instagram could do, like low-hanging fruit, where you know you can imagine them going in and, and for different clusters of content saying, hey, for this topic, how does it make you feel? You know, they could go poll users on lots and lots of these clusters and come back and say, ah, this set of clusters generally makes people feel bad. Imagine if we saw a young person starting to rabbit hole down a bunch of clusters that we know people say make them feel bad. Imagine if we said, how could we design to demonstrate we value autonomy and dignity? 
Like, what would that look like? How, would, how could Instagram demonstrate to us that they valued our autonomy and our dignity? You know, they could ask people like, hey, we noticed you're looking at a lot of stuff. Do you want to keep looking at it? Do you want to see less of it? A lot of bunch, bunch of options. We hear from teenagers over and over again, I, I, I knew I was getting body image issues. I knew that it was making my depression or my suicidality worse. But even when I tried to not engage with that content anymore, it kept following me, right? This is not the same as romance novels or rap music or video games, like all these things we've been afraid of young people engaging with before. Because when you listen to a rap album, you go into the record, or back then, now you have like iTunes or you know streaming, Spotify. But back then, you had to go into a record store and you had to plunk down some money and you had to choose to listen to that record. Right? That was a choice. You had to go out in there and bring it back. And every time you listened to it, you had to put it back on your record player or back on your tape deck. Right? What's happening now is you can take a blank Instagram account, no friends, no interests, and follow some, like, you know, just search for healthy eating or like healthy recipes. Because, like, let's be honest, we could all eat a little better. And just click on the first five or ten items each day. Follow uh, hashtags that are suggested. And within, within two or three weeks, you start getting shown pro-anorexia content, pro-self-harm content. Like anyone who searched for healthy recipes was not looking for self-harm content. Like, I'm sorry, Brussels sprouts do not hurt you that way. Um, and so it's one of these things where it's pr profoundly different to have things that the algorithm, you know, the shortest path to a click is hate, fear, those things, extreme content. It's one thing to have systems about choices, and it's one thing to have systems that keep pushing you towards the extreme. And when that's in a political context, when it's in a context of, of, of teenagers, it can point to tragedy. Once the realm of politics, it pushes us towards division because extreme speech never gets answered. Because I can go out there and write a post that preys on all of your biases, on all of your fears, and if someone writes another post responding to me saying, hey, this is a lot more complicated than you think. Like, you should consider this. What about that? What about if we framed it this way? I'll get lots of comments on mine, even if it's just to tell me I'm full of shit. Um, but that response won't. And what ends up happening is, over and over again, you see a bias towards extreme ideas. So that's my usual soapbox, um, though I will end on a high note at the very end, so don't worry. I know it's a real big downer, but we will end on a high note, so just hold on to that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, I wasn't planning on talking about, but I got to hang out with Gilda earlier, and, uh, and I got to visit some classes, and so I just wanted to respond to some of the stuff that people asked me about. Um, Someone asked me, they were like, you seemed like you were like always really accomplished. Like you did like debate and like, you know, what 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 really is the role for people like me? Like I don't I don't think I don't think I'm anywhere like you. And one, I am 20 years older than you. <laughs> I just want to remind you. Um, but two, um, you know, when I came into Olin, I was not I, I was pretty precarious, right? You can be sitting in those seats right now and be like, you know, I'm, I'm not very strong, right? When I was a freshman, um, you know, I, uh, I have a wonderful mother who deeply cares about me, but she also had really bad postpartum depression when I was a kid. You know, she got depression after my brother was born when I was about, you know, I was about five at that point. And she didn't really get better until I went to Olin. Right, you know, when you have very competent children and you're struggling either physically or mentally, you can end up leaning on your kids more and more. And by the time I showed up at Olin, like, you know, I I was a kid who had been pretty severely neglected, and so I had a lot of deficits. I was uh, definitely not the most popular one in my class. Um, I was tied for a period of years for being the most convicted person in the student judicial system. If any of you have re read the honor board case about sleeping in public places, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> but you know, I should move on. Um, I heard it was actually taught in orientation for a while, which I feel kind of proud about, but you know. Um, 
be, uh, and so I just want you to know, like, it's okay to be kind of a disaster for quite a long time. Um, you know, I, I, I accomplished a huge amount right after Olin. Like, I was the first person from Olin to go to Google. Um, though, is, is Lynn Andrews, does Lynn Andrews Stein still teach here? Oh, yeah. Lynn got me my job at Google, so thank you, Lynn. You know, just little props. Um, many years later, like seven years later, I met the person that Lynn had given my resume to. I was like, wait, wait, are you, did you recommend me? And she's like, oh, yeah, I did. And so, like, full circle. So thank you, Lynn. But, um, like, I, I accomplished a lot there, and, um, uh, and I, got, I, I got to go to Harvard for an MBA, so I applied for what's now called 2 plus 2. Um, I think it's a really great option. Um, technologists often talk down about the practice of management or, like, human organization, and I don't think I could have been a whistleblower without getting my MBA, right? Because while I was at Facebook, um, like, I got my MBA because at Google, I saw that not valuing the practice of management led to really, really inhumane outcomes, right? That Google uh, cared about human talent management, so, or excuse me, managers, management, so much that uh, a single engineering manager would have 50 reports, right? They're basically administrative assistants. And, uh, and I can't watch the show Silicon Valley still. Like, the first season, it's not, it's not a comedy, it's a documentary. Like, ooh, um, like, like rest and vest. Rest and vest is not actually humane. Like, I, I knew someone who um, got left in a, in a room by himself for six months because they were hoping he'd get the hint and quit. Um, it's like not kind, it's not a kind thing. And um, so I went and got an MBA. And uh, one of the classes I took when I was there was a class on change management. Like, it's really hard to get organizations to change. Like the leaders, the, the people, the humans who come in there and say, let's change together. It's, it's a really, there's a very core set of things that you have to do. There's a bunch of things that are nice to have, but there's a few things you have to do because it's so hard to get organizations to change. And, you know, uh, when I showed up at, at Facebook, um, uh, I encountered a variety of, of, of problems, right? Like I um, was really, really shocked at like, people didn't seem to understand the significance of the fact that like, people were becoming literate to use Facebook, right? That in Myanmar, where the first genocide was, um, half of all messages sent on Messenger are voice clips, right? Like people didn't have a depth of history to understand that the few moments in, ooh, Facebook is watching. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, actually, sorry. Give me two seconds. I'm very proud of this because it's so weird. Um, so earlier today, I was at Harvard. And uh, ooh, where'd it go? If I can't find it in a second, I'm not going to do this. Haha. -ha. OK, so I was at Harvard today. And because um, they're, they're going to put up, um, I, I didn't know about this until a few weeks ago, but they're going to actually release the documents. So uh, apparently, like, a hard drive showed up at their place. I think it's from Gizmodo, but I don't know for sure. Um, and they're going to publish all the docs. So I was like meeting with their team and like giving them some advice. And uh, at the end of like the little lecture I gave to the sh their student researchers, a mysterious man walked up to me and he was like, "Thank you for all the work you've done. Like I, I'm, I, 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 like you've you've done so much." And he handed this to me, and it's a challenge coin from the CIA. <laughs> And I'm, I'm really disappointed because I really wanted a Coast Guard one as the first one because, like, they're the best branch because they're the good guys. Uh, but I got a CIA one, so, you know. <laughs> so that was what happened to me today. Um, the, uh, I told my fiancé, and um, he laughed really hard because uh, he was like, oh, my God, there was already a conspiracy about you working for the CIA. Like, this is just going to add to it. But I don't know. I was amused. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a, um, management matters, like the practice of how we treat each other man matters. And um, at, at, at Facebook, they, they got rid of the civic integrity team after the 2020 election. You know, part of why Facebook had not put in motion any of the defenses by 5 p.m. on the day of January 6th. Like, they had a long list of the safety measures that have been on on election day. It's things like, should you boost live video 850x? 
even though you know already that like people are, are committing suicide on live video because you can't stop it. That people are killing other people on live video because you can't stop it or detect it. Um, you know, should you boost that 850 times the score it usually would have earned when you know there's a crisis? So on election day, they said no, that's actually quite dangerous. Like we'll boost it 65X, because you know, it still needs to show up towards the top of the feed. Optimizations. Um, but on, on, on January 6th, that wasn't turned on. It's because like the team that would have been responsible for holding the war room that would have turned on those safety me me mechanisms, those things that have been very carefully researched and plotted out for the, uh, the election, that team had been dissolved, right? And, and the moment they dissolved our team, you know, the number one thing I learned at HBS and the change management class was if you wish your organization to change, the executives have to say very clearly, we are going to change. This is where we're going. And you have to have a center of excellence that's gonna be the place that's gonna model the change and is gonna help other people change and, and lead the way. And they dissolved that part of Facebook. And uh, you know, I was cautiously optimistic when we got rearranged. And I was working at the time on counter espionage. So I was part of the threat intelligence org. So I was a product manager sitting in civic integrity my team was, uh, I worked with people who are threat intelligence researchers under the intelligence organization. And my new manager told me my job wasn't big enough. He also told us to the information operations product manager. You know, he had 17 threat researchers that he worked with. His team wasn't big enough. Or excuse me, his area of scope wasn't big enough. Um, that guy left integrity. He went and worked on something else because his job was big enough. Um, and you know, once that happened, I realized Facebook wasn't going to be able to change on its own. And I, I started thinking about what would I do next. Um, other things that I think I, I want to make sure I didn't part on you. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can be, and oh, sorry, the other thing I want to say there. So, yeah, I got a lot done in my 20s, but even then, I crashed and burned, right? I, I um, part of why I'm sitting is I used to be paralyzed beneath my knees. You know, I have celiacs, and like an invincible 20 something, I did not have a primary care doctor. All of you, when you are 23, I want you to ask yourself, do I have a primary care doctor now that I have graduated from Olin? And if you answer that question with a no, you're gonna go, God, didn't Francis tell me to get a primary care doctor? <laughs> Remember, I'm gonna send you a card. Um, the, uh, so yeah, I got, I, 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 um, I, I was sick enough that I was in the hospital for seven weeks, right? And, and I felt really, really, um, I felt like nothing, right? Because my manager had thought I was lying about being sick for the two years before I, I got put on a performance improvement plan at Google. Right, and, and because my doctors had been telling me, like I, I would go to like the random doctor, I'd, I'd try, I just I didn't have a relationship with a doctor. Um, and I'd be like, I'm in a lot of pain and I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. And they'd say, oh, that sounds like depression. And I was pretty sure I wasn't depressed because I had, I had a psychologist, like I had a psychiatrist. Um, I was pretty sure that was not my problem. Um, and it turned out I had a clot in my leg and I had celiacs and I, I was literally starving to death. Like by the time I got hospitalized, I, I, my protein synthesis, protein synthesis had stopped. And so the reason I bring this up is because I had gone through that experience of being told over and over again that I was a bad employee, I really doubted myself for a few years, right? Like I took a series of jobs that were, were less than what I was capable of because I didn't believe in myself. But in the process of working through those jobs, I realized I actually knew what I was, I, I was interested in, or like I knew what I was doing, right? Um, and so I want you to know, no matter what you feel like as you go through your career, like when you feel weak, I want you all to know that the fact that you're sitting in this auditorium right now means that you are quite competent, right? You're smart people. You might be having a bad year or a bad couple years, but you know, until you're like 70, you have a lot of time to recover. <laughs> I'm just saying. And, and in tech, you're gonna hear over and over again that if you can't get it done in two years, or you can't get it done by the time you're 30, it's not worth doing. 
That's ridiculous. That's the other thing I got from Harvard. So I went and got this MBA. I learned about all these industries that weren't Silicon Valley, and my like, psh, you know? In, in Silicon Valley, like if you can't get something done in two years, it's like it doesn't exist, right? And it's a little bit better now. Like now companies IPO in like 10 years, and so you can have like a four-year plan. Um, but at, at HBS, like the thing I really took away was the idea that anything big, anything really worth doing takes 10 years, right? Um, and once you change that time horizon, you can accomplish so much more. Because you give yourself, as long as you're making progress week by week or month by month, you know, that's the thing that matters, just, just keeping at it. Um, so yeah, don't, don't beat up yourself too much. It's okay to struggle, because you're going to do lots of things. And then the last thing I was going to say was, oh, uh, as you think about picking classes, um, one of the things I'm most grateful for is like I got to take classes at Wellesley. So four of my classes I took at Wellesley. And the class that ended up being the most useful for me in my career was a biogeography class, which is going to sound weird. It's like, Francis, haven't you almost exclusively worked on like consumer algorithms for like, I don't know, since 2007? Um, and it's true. But modern machine learning is really about heterogeneous populations. Like the way uh, species speciate is they have heterogeneous populations that have different forces work upon them. Like some respond to that force, some don't respond. There can be geography that moves people, climate factors, all these things. And uh, in AI systems, the same thing happens. Every user is slightly different. And you can make a product change, and some will move this way, and some will move that way. And you have to understand the feedback loops to understand the second and third order effects of your changes. And you know, if you had asked me back then, like, will this class be useful in your career, I think I probably would have said no. Right? Like, I didn't plan on being a geographer or a biologist. Like, what do you use biogeography for? But I want you to be really open-minded about the idea that following things that you're curious about, especially at this stage in your life, is incredibly valuable. And I want to give you a little tiny framing on that, and then I'll probably just like break for questions, um, which is you don't know what the world will be like in the future. right? You don't know what problems we're going to need to solve. We don't know what the opportunities will be. And the number one thing that will let you have like interesting adventures is being a person who is really passionate and works hard at whatever they do. And a thing that I didn't appreciate in grad school uh, was they would give us these pep talks where they'd be like, all of you are so capable. You all got into Harvard Business School. You know, you can do anything. You don't want to be a McKinsey partner. <laughs> and, and they're like, you know, go out, be an entrepreneur, do all these things, you'll be happier. Because I think being a McKinsey partner requires a lot of life choices that I don't, I don't think are correlative with being happy. But that's just kind of my, my gut check from being like a 37-year-old. Um, like it's a lot of time on the road, it's a lot of time away from your family, it's a lot of competition. Um, and often you have to do like work on things that are like might challenge your, your compass. But I didn't understand that. I, didn't, I think they didn't communicate it the right way at the time. And so I'm going to try to communicate to you guys in a way that may be more effective. Um, so. The thing I wish they had said to me, because at the time I was kind of annoyed with them, I was like, I kind of think I would like being a McKinsey partner. Like, I love the idea of convincing you that you should let me work on your problem and then proving to you that it was worth it, right? Like, I, I could do that. I love, like, curiosity, doing lots of different things. Um, what I wish they had said to me was, you can choose to do the path that you think you should do. So things that fall into the, the path you think you should do Let's call them commodity paths, right? They are the, pa the most obvious path between like here and there versus the path that like you are curious about or the path you are passionate about or, or just the path that makes you happy. So the commodity path is a path. Like the reason it is a commodity path is it is the obvious path. And it means a lot of people run at that. And if you have the exact same experiences as people on the commodity path, you are a commodity. You're interchangeable. It's very, it means the thing that differentiates you is, yes, how smart you are, but it's also things like how many sacrifices are you willing to make in your personal life? You know, how hard are you willing to work? Versus like, how creative are you? Or like, uh, you know, maybe you're just giving something unique and therefore you're, you're um, 
in, 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 in business school, they've talked about this idea of you can be in a red ocean, so it's like an ocean full of sharks, it's competitive, it's like ruthless, like you have lots of competitors, you have to have narrow margins. Or you can be in the blue ocean, and that's like where people are not, it's a new space, like it's emergent, it's new. And so there's not a bunch of competitors, there's not a bunch of ruthlessness. And the example they always give is like traditional circuses versus Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil did a very different thing. And no one, no one competed with them for a very long time. No one still kind of competes with them. They get to do their thing and they get to have fun. In life, you can choose to do things that you enjoy and just remember you will work harder and more passionately and more intensely on things that you enjoy doing than things you don't enjoy doing. And part of why I got to work at Facebook was there were very few people in the world when I was getting recruited who had done a lot of algorithmic product management. And the reason I had done a bunch of algorithmic product management was when I was 22, 22 um, I got put on a project that I thought was very cool, but in retrospect was probably a demotion. Um, I liked it though, and this is why Cal and I are friends. So it's just called Google Books. And no one at Google cared about Google Books. And I thought at the time, I had been like, oh, Marissa Meyer has intuited the thing that will make me most happy. And I, I, I realized in retrospect, I'm like, God, Google did not care about Google Books. Um, <laughs> but because I loved books, and I, it was interesting, I, I was not a particularly, I was not at the top of my APM class, so associate product manager class, because I was, I was an analog electrical engineer. Like, I, I love elect electrical engineering because I love music. Like, I took, ooh, ooh Diana's not here. So I love Diana Dabby's signals and systems class. Um, if she is up there, yeah. Yay, music. Yay, synthesis. But, um, uh, and, but it meant that when I showed up at Google, I knew almost no programming because, like, they hadn't really cracked that night yet on, like, how to teach program. Like, we didn't learn Python. Like, I never learned Python. That's how old I am, people. I took Java. <laughs> Contemplate that. Um, I think I'm the only class where the introductory computer was taught in C. Oh, C. Come on, people. And, and, and Java. Yeah. But um, so I came in with, like, almost no programming. And um, I, I was totally an anomaly. There was only one other person who uh, came in with not a CS background. Um, but I had hustled very hard. And, uh, and but I, because the search team would not give the book search team a search quality PM, our director took a chance on me and was like, oh, you're smart and you work hard and you seem motivated. I'll teach you how to do search quality. And so he taught me how to do search quality. And the first time I got to work with search queries, I just like fell in love with it because no one is as honest with search engines as like there's no one in people's lives that are as honest with each other as they are with search engines. Like people tell search engines everything, like stuff that they're they're wrestling with, stuff they feel conflicted with. Like I always say, it's like it's like a Russian novel. Like it's like the soul in conflict with itself, right? Oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> And I loved the idea that there were people in need who needed something, and they didn't necessarily know where to turn. They might have no one to turn to, but they could turn to Google, and Google could help them. And it was just like a thing that really, really motivated me. And it meant that I got exposed to data science when data science was a new thing. Like, if you roll back in time to 2007, they were still doing, like, Time magazine covers with, like, ooh, the data science. Like, Netflix has the data science, um, you know? <laughs> Um, you know, I know the world was different back then. And, um, but because I happened to be at Google and I happened to work on search quality, and there were almost no PMs that really liked search quality, right? There were, like, they had only the first PM at Google who really clicked with search quality was in 2006. Is that crazy? Google had been around for 10 years at that point. Um, and so it happened to be because I followed just this thing that I enjoyed, I ended up getting this very interesting series of experiences. Um, it was not the obvious path, it was not the commodity path. And so it meant that by the time 2019 rolled around, like, there weren't a lot of people who were qualified for the job that I ended up getting. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I encourage you to go and find things that you love doing, and, and don't be too judgy on yourself on whether or not you think it's like a, a successful path, you know? Like, if you think it's a thing that adds value to the world, you can almost always monetize adding value to the world. And I think a thing that would be really useful is we should have more conversations about what do alternate paths to self-sufficiency look like. 
Um, and this is my last thing. Because like part of, I want to be real clear, part of what allowed me to be brave, and we have to talk about these things, part of what allowed me to be brave was right before COVID, um, the, the market crashed for COVID, I had been watching COVID really closely. Like I'm a math, I'm a data scientist, I'd made a spreadsheet. I'd, I'd made a spreadsheet and been basically like, wow, this is gonna like hit the fan. Like this is gonna be bad. And the market hadn't crashed yet, and so I shorted it, <laughs> right? And, and it's one of those things like, hey, I wasn't into finance at that point, right? I had, I, had, I had literally been so hostile to finance that I walked out of my finance final in, in grad school. I was like, I have a lot of shit to do today. You know, this is three hours. I'm not going to spend my time on this. And I walked out, right? Because my grades, no one asks about your grades after your MBA. This is not a thing. Um, so that's my level of hostility to finance. But I, I shorted the market. And I, I guess the thing I want to say is like, there are other ways to make money than jobs that make you unhappy. And I want you to hold on to that because I started thinking about it really hard at that point and being like, are there other ways to support myself than big tech? And when I became convinced that I could do that either through finance or doing something else on the internet, because you're all smart, you're gonna be able to figure things out. It, it gave me the feeling of security enough that I could take a risk. And that's the thing I want for you all. I want you to be able to follow things that you're passionate about and that make you happy. And I want you to trust that if you don't follow the commodity path, if you follow your heart and really double down on it, it's likely that you are going to be able to monetize that in some way and be able to like have a comfy life because you're all smart and creative people. And that having that sense of security, like taking risks and either failing and then realizing you can get back up, because that gives you resiliency, or just having the risks turn out okay makes you braver and braver. Because that's the way we get stronger. That's the way we move forward in the world. And the reality is you are all incredibly special people because you don't realize this yet, but there's, there's not a lot of engineers who get taught context beyond engineering. And you guys have gotten a very unique education that will help you have an outsized impact in the world. And so I have a, a huge amount of faith in you all, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Francis. Um, hi, I'm uh, Erhard Graef, Assistant Professor of Social and Computer Science here at Olin. And it's been my pleasure to work on this co-curricular all spring with Frances. Um, and one of those pleasures has been being able to ask her lots of questions when we meet via Zoom. Um, and now it's your turn for that. Um, a reminder about questions. Uh, questions are things that come in the form of a question. Uh, that means they have an answer uh, that Frances could give to them. Um, we have some questions that have come in ahead of time, um, which were very well thought out. Um, uh, and so I'm going to start with one of those, and then Sam and Kat have a microphone. Uh, that will, there's a throwable microphone that will pass through the audience uh, to do in-person questions. So the first question that came up um, was, what was the most surprising thing to come out of the reactions to the revelations that you brought to the world? Um, I was really happy with my Senate hearing. So I don't, I don't know if you guys remember back in 2018, um, like the Senate hearing was kind of disastrous. Like a senator actually asked Mark Zuckerberg, like, how do you make money? And like Mark had to like look at them and be like, we run ads. <laughs> um, so like the thing I was really, really impressed about was um, the, uh, we, had, we had a bunch of support from a bunch of Senate aides, so like, uh, and we gave the opportunity to hold, for them to ask questions beforehand. Like we held briefing calls. And um, we had on the order of like 25 to 30 uh, legislative age, which is apparently unheard of. Like you, you can't get people to show up for these things. Um, show up and ask really good questions for like two hours. And so the fact that my Senate hearing went as well as it did wasn't just the actions of like, you know, like people give me a lot of credit for that, but like it's also a lot of people put in a lot of work to make sure that the senators had like good lines of inquiry to talk about, to ask good questions. Um, and I think that's one of those things is that we, we forget that the way we move forward is we, we all have to move forward. Like these, these aren't the actions of a single person. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, I guess the other thing that's been really surprising for me is like I haven't gotten like 
any harassment online. Like I have open DMs, um, like on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, and I've gotten like 15, or like maybe, maybe 20 mean tweet, like mean DMs, period, and since I came out. And I don't get sexually harassed. And as someone who worked on like civic issues, like women who are public figures often get you know, treated poorly on the internet, which I think is a, 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 um, a result of like, the public is ready for change. Very few people are siding with like their hero Mark Zuckerberg um, in, you know, in this like fight of wills. All right, so we see some shows of hands and we'll pass the mic around. Uh, I wanna start right there with, uh, looks like Jerry. Okay, so I'm curious what the nature of employees was like at Facebook while they're perpetuating all of these injustices. How did you feel working there and how did people seem working on these types of projects? So I think a, a really important, so one, I highly encourage all of you to work at Facebook. Like I think it's really important. Like it's, it's, I think it's the most important job someone can have in the world right now is to work at Facebook because it is the internet for a billion or two billion people. Most of the people at Facebook are kind, empathetic, compassionate people, but they're working within a system of incentives that makes it very difficult to do the right thing. Um, I encourage you all to read this, this amazing essay called The Power of the Powerless. It's by this guy named Vaclav Havel who led the Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic. Like he was one of the key architects of the fall of the Soviet Union. And he talks about this idea of systems that are governed through ideology, right? That where, where there are totalitarian systems that are ruled through force, and there are post-totalitarian systems that are ruled through ideology. And in a system that is ruled by an ideology, in the case of Facebook, some of those concepts are uh, all these problems already existed before we got here. We're just a mirror. You're unhappy that we're showing you things you don't like. Um, and things like we can govern through metrics, right? Like, you know, metric go up is enough. Um, and questioning, did Facebook play a role in, in, in influencing these things? Or like, are they, is it a force that's fanning these fires? If you push too hard on, on those areas, the system heals around you. Like you get put, you get marginalized. You know, I went through a period of time for like six months where I was given half an engineer and half a researcher and basically like left alone with the, like, them being like, I hope you quit. Um, and, and, uh, and the joke's on them, because I live with chronic pain and you should never try to outlast me. Just saying. Um, but uh, the, um, the other thing we need to acknowledge is that in the wake of my disclosures, they locked down all the safety information inside the company. So unless you worked in integrity, you could not read the safety information. Like this got leaked to the New York Times. And the comment threads on the post discussing this policy were saying this would not have stopped Francis. Like she worked in integrity. So the only thing that is accomplished by this policy is that the people who build the products now cannot confirm that these things are true, right? They can't know that the consequences of these products or that, that I did not take these things out of context. Um, and so we need to not blame people who necessarily don't know that these factors are happening. The last one I wanna talk about is another one of these organizational dynamic issues. Like, this, like I said before, like I really care about, I think getting an MBA is a thing to consider. You can be a, you know, a pro-social person and get an MBA. Um, and, and, and there are lots of other ones in MBA programs. There are definitely sharks. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Um, but, uh, and, which is knowledge does not reproduce itself at Facebook or at any organization if it's not viewed as useful. Right? Different organizations have different ways of organizing information. And at Facebook, the information is organized in a tool that kind of looks like Facebook, but it's like internally available. So it's not a search engine. You, know, you can't go and easily scroll through 30 or 40 pages looking for the right thing. It's like literally you have to scroll on a feed. And so it means that unless someone wants to make sure you learn information from the past, it's very difficult to discover. It's very difficult to discover. Um, Facebook also rewards moving impact um, metrics up and doesn't really reward documentation. So there's like almost no documentation. And so you have a situation, you have a situation, well some people say, you know, documentation is just lies. 
because you know it's always out of date. But I think still, documentation is good. Um, you should just invest more in it. But um, the, uh, and so we need to be, we need to acknowledge that too, that there are lots of really good people inside who did not get taught about some, a lot of the stuff that was in these disclosures. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's difficult for them to even know that those deficits are there. So we have to be a little sensitive on how we characterize um, people there. Hi. Nice throw. All right, hello. Hi. Um, sort of on that note about documentation always being out of date, I feel like, so we all understand that technology evolves at this point at a rate that's, it almost feels unsustainable to build any form of oversight that adapts at that same rate. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how to design that kind of system that can keep track and hold accountable these systems that are evolving at such a crazy rate in comparison to the amount of time it takes to you know, build studies and understand exactly where the harm lies and all of that. I'm so glad you asked this question. There's so many layers to unpack. So, so one is the presumption that we should have to gather information in order to have behavior change, right? The, there's in, in children's toys, in physical toys, you must have safety by design, right? If a kid chokes on a part from your toy and the parents come to you and say, my child died, show me where you considered that this piece could break off. Where you said like, oh, like, you know, what are we doing to reduce that risk or disclose that risk? Um, if you can't demonstrate that you had safety by design, you're liable. And, and uh, a very, very important thing happened over the weekend. A thing called the Digital Services Act was passed in Europe. Um, I, I have spent six weeks lobbying in Europe since I came out because this piece of law had been in the cards for five years. They've been trying to pass it for five years. Um, and it was seen as like the best bet to get something that could be you know, an, an ongoing system of regulation. And, and the difference between how they write laws in Europe and how they write them in the United States, and this is the thing that I learned about all since I came out, did not know about this, um, is that in the United States we have rule-based laws. So we say, you may not do X, Y, Z. And in Europe they have principle-based laws. They say, when you design, you need to keep these things in mind. Um, and uh, in the case of Europe, one of the, the way they're gonna be approaching regulation going forward is they're gonna require companies to do risk assessments every year and disclose them to the government. They are going to, the, the regulator themselves is gonna talk to stakeholders and say like, hey, your risk assessment had these problems, hey, you got all these other problems too. And they have the ability, uh, and we now have, the, for the first time, this is such a big deal, for the first time we have the ability for independent researchers to get data directly, which is a huge deal. Back in 2020, the first big boycott of Facebook happened. It was called Stop Hate for Profit in the wake of like the rioting. And a whole bunch of advertisers stopped advertising. And Facebook came back and said, it's okay, we fixed hate speech. And because they couldn't independently verify, like Facebook pointed out some things they had done. They were like, we took these accounts down. Um, because no one could independently see what was going on, you know, there's no way to say, no, 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 you didn't actually accomplish what we asked you for. Um, and I think that's actually also an example of different kinds of asks they could have done. So like I said, I just came from the mommy bloggers. They're great. Um, and I, they were asking me, like, what should we demand? So imagine, so I, what I said was, there should be an expectation that every month, Facebook should have to put up a blog post saying, to demonstrate that we value the safety of your children, this is everything we shipped this month, that we believe improve the safety of your children. And if next month that list isn't long enough, you need to shame them. Like, you need to be out there with like, you know, pictures of dead kids, because that's what's happening. There's a public health crisis if that list of, of changes to keep kids safe isn't long enough. And that's an example of an ask that is a systems ask. It is a, you're asking for a process, you're not asking for a feature. And I get put under pressure a lot being like, you know, this is our only chance to get change. Like, you're wasting your moment to get change because um, I'm not asking for like, fix these three things. Um, I think the way we got here is not enough people were sitting at the table. Like, I earnestly believe that right now there's 300 or 400 people in the entire world 
who understand how these algorithms work well enough and the interactions with product features. Um, and the reason for that is you can't take any college courses anywhere in the world right now in, in the kinds of things that I'm recommending. That's things like saying, you know, if Alice posts something and her friend Bob reshares it and Carol, their friend of friend reshares it and it lands in Dan's newsfeed, you know, Dan, because we, we you know, Facebook could say, because we value intentionality, now that you're beyond friends of friends, you, you don't really know Alice, you can totally spread that. You can say whatever you want. It can be hate speech, it can be violence, it can be nudity, whatever you want to do. But you have to choose to do it. You have to copy and paste it to keep moving it on. You have to choose to. And putting that intentionality in the loop doesn't prioritize some ideas over others. You know, it treats all ideas the same. But it ends up reducing misinformation by the same amount as third party fact checking. Only it works in every language in the world. It works in those fragile countries that are vulnerable today. All right, who's next? Yeah. Um, maybe go up a little higher. Sure. So where is the microphone? There is. Yeah. Do you want to pass it over? Yeah, all the way across, right behind you. That's pretty yeah. good. That's pretty good. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the role of micro-targeting in um, causing a lot of these problems and in terms of regulation as well. Um, could, you, could you repeat the beginning of your question again? I yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about micro-targeting in terms micro of how, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like, you know, where you're following people you know and you're not spreading content as rapidly, um, and how you see that affecting um, both these dynamics that you're talking about and about regulation um, going forward. Great question. So um, I worked on something called narrow casting, which is where they send targeted misinformation to specific uh, groups of people, uh, specific geographies, specific individuals. Um, and uh, I think micro-targeting is, is a thing we need to talk about. So my team was formed because um, there was a Russian influence operation in the fall of 2019 that was targeting African-American activists, environmental activists, uh, gay activists, and police officers. Can't imagine how that would go wrong. Um, you know, guns and misinformation always belong together. Um, and uh, Facebook understandably freaked out and moved us off of basically dealing with misinformation in places that didn't have third party fact checking and has focus on narrow casting. And um, micro targeting takes a lot of different forms. So, some of that micro targeting is ads. And a thing about ads that we all have to talk about is the same kind of engagement-based ranking. So that's saying something that gets more likes, more comments, more reshares is better. Um, that same system exists in ads. So every time you get shown an ad, they run a little auction for like how valuable is your attention at that moment? How, how much does that advertiser actually want to reach you? How good, how good was their ad? And the way they determined how good the ad was was like how likely are you to engage with it? And on, like I said before, the fastest path to a click is hate. You know, it's, you get way more, um, you're more willing to get a comment when you make people angry than when you are compassionate. And that means an angry, polarizing, divisive ad, extreme ad, is gonna be worth five to 10 times less, it's gonna be cheaper, five to 10 times cheaper than an empathetic or compassionate ad because an empathetic or compassionate ad or reconciliation ad doesn't trigger you to put a comment on it or like put a like on it. That's the same way that one that does the praise on your anger or your vulnerabilities. And we can't have a democracy if we allow people to micro-target ads and then make divisive ads really, really cheap. The other kind of micro-targeting that happens is via groups. So you can reach basically any party you want in the United States even without an ad um, just by finding the right Facebook group, right? You can get down to very, very small things. And the reason why this matters is when we spread misinformation to a specific like population, we can estrange them from the rest of our community, right? So in the case of COVID misinformation, 80% of the COVID misinformation went to 4% of the population. You know, it's, it's one of these things where when people talk about the experience of the average person on Facebook and how, you know, they don't see that much news or they don't see that much hate speech, they don't see that much of whatever. I'm like, that's not the person that matters. The 95th, per the 95th percentile person is the person that matters. And the reason for that is if you're sitting in an environment where you're getting barraged with misinformation saying your child's teacher is trying to hurt your child by making them wear a mask, 
Your school district is trying to kill your child by vaccinating them, and you see it over and over and over again. And when people try to post pro-vaccine information, they either get banned from the group or they get um, piled on. You know, people just rage on them in the comments. You learn either not to talk about certain topics in those groups or you just see over and over again only one side. And that has real consequences. Um, I spoke to the American Federation of Teachers, and they said, across the United States, we've had people showing up at teachers' houses, at their homes, and screaming at them about these things. You know, we've had them showing up at school board meetings and melting down. And it's because those people who are hyper-exposed get really, really, really exposed. Um, and so micro-targeting these, these infra information sub-environments can be very, very dangerous. We have one right in front here. Hello. Um, having worked both at Google and Facebook, how can you compare the way that they've um, designed safety into their system? Um, and yeah. how would you say one is better than the other, or mm -hmm. how would they um, be similar or different? And then um, on top of that, because both of their um, revenue streams and a lot of social media's revenue streams are based on ads, and like you mentioned several times, ads use hate and anger. How can they or any new up and coming social media platform be healthy or safe for humans if their entire revenue stream is based on anger and hate? So, um, let's see, where to, where to unpack on there? So, we had the, the business, oh, Facebook versus Google. So, let's start with Facebook versus Google. So it's really important before we dive in to talk about how these products are different algorithmically. So Google is a search engine and Facebook is a recommender system. So one of the key things to keep in mind when you're working on a search engine, like Facebook, Google invested a phenomenal amount of money in a system of evaluation called side-by-sides. So in a side-by-side, -side, you run the old version of the algorithm and the new version of the algorithm and you get your search results and they had thousands and thousands of these people around the world who were trained to, in very minute details, uh, evaluate, like, is this search results better than that search results, and why? Um, and every time we would evaluate a change, um, you'd send it out for a side-by-side, -side, and you get 500 queries, and at least three people looked at every pair of queries, and sometimes as many as nine people. Right? It was a system that was designed for precision. Every single one of those evaluators was constantly being judged on their ability to be aligned with the other raters. Um, so that system is evaluated via humans in the loop. Like humans are in a very real way making the choice on every single step, is this better, is this worse? Um, and it was designed to be so precise because if you can't consistently say, are we getting better or worse, it's very hard to continue going up over time, especially when, like the reality is Google's really quite good. Like getting better from where we are is very hard. Um, Facebook is a recommender system. Recommender systems are, the results are different for every single person. There's no concept of this is good. Um, you have to go and look at experimental search results and like, you know, you'll have 150 metrics and you'll have the ability to slice and dice by hundreds of different specific groups. Um, uh, speaking of micro-targeting. Turns out new users who are over the age of this age that speak this language in Guatemala are not doing as well. Um, like you can really go down to that level, and um, uh, and then you'll and then you'll look at many time lots of different time frames. So in that world, the thing that is stepping us from step to step to step on the algorithm is is metrics, not human perspective. Um, and I think it's really important when we're trying to unpack like how did Facebook get to where it is because. Their, their culture grew up in this quantitative way where it's not so much about human intuition driving the next step. It's like we have to be able to you know, be led by the metrics. Um, and that's very different than say things like WhatsApp. Like WhatsApp, because they can't look at the metrics on lots of things, um, they spend a lot, lot more time thinking about what will be the consequences of this action. Like what would people want, what would make them happy? Um, and this is written about in the documents, this idea that you don't have to have a culture like Facebook's culture. Um, and I, I, one of the things I'm writing about in my memoir, um, which is coming out, I think, this March, is about this idea of, do we have agency over the algorithm? Like, are we guided by an algorithm, or, are we, or do, we have, do we have agency? Um, because there's lots of different kinds of algorithms in our lives. It's things like that, what's the commodity path? Like, what's our habits? What's our, what's our origin story? All these things. Um, do we have agency to change? Can we be different people? 
Um, and so uh, that's kind of the difference between those two. And then what was the second half of your question? Yeah. Um, if social media platforms Oh, ads. Are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, so one thing is I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about, I, I, I'm a very mixed feelings about um, Elon Musk coming in, because I, I do worry he is not, he doesn't have a great history um, around women. Um, uh, and so I worry a little bit that he's like not going to um, take action on like, you know, harassment of women politicians on social media is bad enough that like, you know, the UK had been getting steadily more and more and more women politicians for 30 years. And um, in the last year, a whole bunch of very senior cabinet level women quit and they said, I get too many death threats. Like I just get too many. Social, it's horrible on social media. There's no consequences. They get worse every year. I, I, I'm just tired of having my life threatened. Right? Um, and I worry that that's not going to be an issue that he's very um, open to. But the thing I am excited about is taking Twitter private means that he can make short-term sacrifices for long-term success. So I always like to say, I am not against Facebook. I think Facebook adds a lot of joy to people's lives. I just want them to be more long-term successful than they are currently set up to be. Like they optimize for short-term success so much they don't get to take the actions that would actually make them long-term successful. Elon Musk is about to get a really cool opportunity, um, which he has made some indications he might actually take to take these short-term sacrifices for long-term success. So I'll give you an example. He got up at TED and said, we're taking the robots down. Like, we are gonna crack down on bots really, really hard. And someone in one of the Olin classes I stopped by today was like, I, I mentioned this, and she's like, I don't know, like, I don't know that's really gonna happen, because like, I found this bot, and it did X, Y, Z, and blah, 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 and I was like, Okay, but the important part of that sentence was, you found that bot. Like, and I'm not being critical of Olin students, you guys are very competent, but like, I'm sorry, some data scientist with 10 years of experience should have found that bot before you did. Why didn't they take it down, right? Um, you're totally right, someone who posts every hour, 24 hours a day, uh, it's probably not a human. Um, and, but the reason they don't is if Facebook's number of users goes down by 1%, the stock crashes. I guarantee you the same thing as a thing Twitter struggles with is like, we could take these bots off. Yes, they are the biggest danger on the platform, right? Because they amplify misinformation. They really skew the information environment. Um, but, you know, we have very detailed standards for what does it mean to have a dollar you know, they're called generally accepted accounting principles. You didn't think you were coming to a lecture on accounting today, did you? Um, we have very specific standards on what it means to have a dollar because companies have lied about the dollars they had. They've played games with accounting for their money to make their companies look more valuable. We lack rules today on what is a human. When can you claim you have a human on your platform? And I have a friend who is a, 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 the CEO, or excuse me, he used to be the CEO of the largest caption in the world. And he was pointing out that they knew exactly which sites had too many bots because the owners of those sites would always set their safety settings at the lowest level. There is a large uh, conservative broadcasting site that got all of its uh, DOS protection revoked. You know, they were with, I think, probably Cloudflare. And Cloudflare was like, nope, no more neo-Nazis. Um, and they came to them and were like, hey, like, can you give us, uh, you know, bot, can you keep us from getting uh, denial of service, and uh, they really wanted this site to go away. And so they said a price that was 100 times the price they charged their next most expensive customer because they really wanted them to go away. And they came back and they were like, can you promise you won't kick us off for a year? And they were like, okay, sure. And so they turned everything on. And they called them up the next week and they are like, we think something's wrong. 90% of our users went away. And they were like, yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you stop bots. And they're like, no, 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 like our metrics look really bad. And it's like, Ugh. And so they turned it all the way down so they only stop the DOS stuff. They don't stop the bots. So there's this question. Elon Musk has said, we're going to take the bots down. Like, I understand. Like, I don't have to worry about quarter to quarter numbers of users. Like, we're going to take it private. And, and that could radically change and affect improve Twitter. All right, we're, we're almost out of time. We're gonna take one more question from that was submitted ahead of time. Um, you answered so many of the ones that were, yeah. you were really good at anticipating these. Um, but you talked about the fact that you're founding a nonprofit um, and that you're trying to build a movement mm -hmm. around these things. So, um, so someone asked, what are your current most pressing needs and how can we as a community best support you? 
Um, so we are gonna be starting um, an open source project that is around a simulated social network. So right now, um, like I mentioned before, you can't take even a single class. Um, if I repeat myself, I don't remember if I said this already. Uh, did I talk about simulated social networks already? Yes, no, no, okay, good. I did, I did, I, I've done it twice earlier today with other classes, so I, oh, it blurs together. Um, uh, right now, you can't take even a single class on the d dynamics of these networks, right? Like the idea that, you know, you could downregulate 1% of users, like the, the, like the, the, the super, 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 super intense users, or you could help users go to sleep, right? You know, you could, you could help them go to sleep at, at 10 o'clock instead of going to sleep at two o'clock, and all of us benefit, because now they don't send us as much misinformation, right? Um, the, um, but you, right now we don't have a way to teach that. We need a lab bench to allow us to teach those classes, just like we have a lab bench to teach chemistry. You know, chemistry allows us to have environmental science majors that keep us safe every day with regulations. Um, we, I, when we start that open source project, if you guys want coding projects and you want to help out for, uh, on an open source thing, that's a huge, huge beneficial thing. Um, another is as we work on establishing duty of care, Right, so duty of care is this idea of if you sell a car today and you don't include a seatbelt, you're going to get sued, right? Because someone's going to die and, and they're going to be like, hey, we've known for 50 years you should put seatbelts in cars. You've got to put a seatbelt in the car. Um, and you'll be held liable for that choice. For, duty, for, for litigation, we're trying to shift the conversation from I was shown this piece of bad content to what was the series of choices Facebook made and what were the consequences of those choices? So I'll give you an example um, uh, for keeping under 13-year-olds off the platform. Facebook got up at uh, the Senate hearing right after mine and said, we care so much about children. We stopped 600,000 under 13 accounts last year. There are documents in the disclosure that say for certain cohorts on Facebook, Facebook Blue, 20% um, of 11-year-olds were on Facebook. Way more kids are online now than were then. There's at least 20% of 11-year-olds on Instagram today. That should be way more than 600,000 accounts. So what should be the duty of care for keeping an under 13 year old off the platform? That's a thing where we can work together on that, articulating what's the list of problems and what are the levers that we could be doing to address those problems. And then I think the, the other two that are big opportunities to help um, are on ESG standards. You know, what is a good, what, how should we assess the difference between Twitter and Facebook? You know, how do we talk about the different choices they made? Governance structures, transparency, like how transparent are things? What are the factors that determine whether or not something should be considered an environmental, a sustainable, or a good governance stock? Because right now, Facebook is considered a good governance, or the, like a, one of these sustainable stocks because they don't make carbon products, and you know, they're, not, they're not an oil company, and they don't make bullets. There has to be a higher bar than that. So that's another area where like, that would be really fun Oz projects, you know, go research those things, send them in. And then the last area is around um, uh, organizing high schoolers and junior high kids and elementary kids. So right now, Facebook's own docs say, kids say, I am suffering alone. Like, because my parent did not grow up with social media, when I tell them, you know, I'm really unhappy, I don't like using this, I can't stop my usage, if I leave, I'll be ostracized, my parent makes me feel alone. It makes me feel like it's my fault, because they say, why don't you just stop using it? And these, you know, 10-year-olds are like, it's my fault I can't stop using it instead of saying these products are designed to be sticky. They were never designed for children, and yet they're being allowed to be accessed by children. We need to figure out how to help high schoolers start clubs where they can talk to each other, where every kid, every kid, every kid has at least someone who is looking out for them in this way because we are facing a public health emergency. Like, I have gone to meet a number of parents whose kids have died. And the thing they say over and over again is, I found out afterwards my kid had been looking at self-harm content for months. Right? We need to figure out a, a scalable way to help those kids while we work on fixing the products. Because waiting five years to fix these things is unacceptable. Because every single year, kids die that don't deserve to die. And so if that's an area, like how can we communicate with a, with a 10 year old? How do you talk to a 10 year old about social media? That would be a fun like user oriented project. Go into elementary schools, get them, just, get them to articulate their experience of social media. Talk about ways of like giving them, um, them and their parents tools for navigating these experiences because the kids are gonna get exposed. 
um, or games. What are games we can use to explain the idea of collective action versus individual action? Right now, a 13-year-old that wants to hang out with their friends more in person doesn't get to make that choice independently. Because if their friends don't also want to hang out, hang out in person, that choice doesn't exist. We need to explain to kids the idea that if all of them did 30% less social media, they would get an opportunity to connect with each other in person more. And we can figure out like what are the blockers that are keeping kids from being able to have those experiences. So those are the kinds of things that I would love the perspective of people younger than myself. Because I am I'm 37. To a 13-year-old, I am ancient. To an eight-year-old, I'm like, you know, who is this giant? You know? Um, but yeah, thank you. Can we have another show of appreciation for Olin's own <laughs> Francis Howard? Yeah. yeah. I want to end on a high note. Um, wait, 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 we're not done. I promised we would end on a high note, so give me, I need 30 more seconds. Okay, all communication technologies are disruptive. They're all disruptive. Every single one we've invented has been disruptive. Like, we invented the printing press, and we got things like religious wars, and pamphlets on witches. They could be next door. What do you do when you find a witch? You clearly burn them. And people died. A lot of people died. You know, a third of Europe died in the religious wars that came after the Protestant Reformation. Um, which was driven by literacy. You know, part of what happened in the Protestant Reformation was suddenly 3% of the population could read, went to 30% of the population could read, and all kinds of stuff got unleashed at the same time. Uh, we invented cheap printing presses, also known as newspapers, and we had literally wars based on yellow journalism. And we developed new norms, new laws of governing ownership, transparency of ownership and, and governance around newspapers. Part of why Hitler rose to power was he was really, really good at new media. Like he did stuff with cinema that no one had ever done before in terms of, of, of being a, a governmental official. Or uh, radio, he used radio in ways that no one had ever seen and had huge consequences. TV, need I say more? Over and over and over again, we have gone beyond our skis, we've gone out ahead of ourselves and we've had to recognize the consequences, think really hard and figure out new ways forward. But we did it, we did it every single time before. And right now, you feel overwhelmed when you think about these things because they are really big topics. They're really scary. But the reason you feel overwhelmed is it happens to be this is our burden. This is our time to shine. This is our time to make the change. And we're going to do it. We've done it every time before. It's just going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. But I believe in you. I believe in us all together. And we can do this. So thank you. So hopefully we will see uh, many of you in the Olin community um, uh, a week from today for the inauguration of President Gilda Barabino. And right now, please join us outside for a reception with Francis.